Chapter Nine of Around the Campfire by Charles Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine: The Last Campfire, Part One. We got away from Detour du Lac in the early morning and reached the outlet, the head of the Madawaska River, after a brisk paddle of some eight miles. The run down the Madawaska was swift and easy, a rapid current and a clear channel. What more could canoemen wish? late in the afternoon we pitched tent on a woody hill half a mile above edmonston to signalize our return to civilization we visited the hotel and post office and then returned to camp for tea the fire blazed right merrily that night and to ward off melancholy thoughts we told stories as usual boys said stranion i've saved for this last night in camp the one that i count choicest of all my yarns the scene of it lies on those very waters which we have lately passed through name demanded i sharpening my pencil with a business air just uh, indian devils replied stranion it was a scorching noon in mid-july of eighteen eighty five dear old h and i were in camp on the upper waters of the squatook not far below the mouth of beardsley brook how h loved to get away from his professorial dignity and freely unbend in the woods he used to swear he would never again put on a starched collar but his big american university keeps him a prim enough now we had called a halt for dinner and siesta in a small sandy cove where the river eddied listlessly it was a hollow between high banks down which drew a soft breeze as through a funnel and the deep grass fringing the tiny beach was densely shadowed by a tangle of vines and branches our birch canoe was behind us her resined sides well shaded from the heat at the water's edge flickered the remnants of our fire paled and browbeaten by the steady downpour of sunshine the stream itself for a wonder grown drowsy idled over its pebbly bed with a sleep-inducing murmur while we were thus idling and dreaming i was startled wide awake by the grating of a paddle on a line of gravelly shoals above the point a moment more and a birch canoe swept into view and drew up at our landing-place the crew two youngish-looking indians having lifted their craft out of the water stalked silently up the beach and paused before us leaning on their paddles with a non-committal grunt they accepted some proffered tobacco glanced over our baggage eyed greedily the bright nickel plating on our trout rods and murmured something in melicete which i failed to comprehend the professor somewhat annoyed at this intrusion blinked sleepily at them for a while and then proceeded to sort and stow away his latest acquired specimens amongst which were some splendid bits of pyrites glittering richly in the sun one of our visitors was not unknown to me he was a certain joe tobin of ill repute hailing from francis village the other was an older-looking man with high cheekbones and little pig-like half-shut eyes the appearance of neither had any attraction for me but the indian with the pig-like eyes i found particularly distasteful these eyes grew intent at once as they caught the yellow gleam of the pyrites but their owner preserved his air of stoical indifference approaching the professor's side he sought a closer examination but the professor was not propitiatory he dumped the ore into his specimen box before the indian could touch it and shifting the box deeper into the shade he took his seat upon it the box was plainly heavy and a gleam of interest crept into the cunning eyes of joe gold maybe he suggested persuasively to which the professor facetiously grumpy answered yeah all gold fool's gold at this a most greedy glance passed furtively between the indians and it flashed upon me that by the barbaric ear fool's gold might be misinterpreted to full of gold i gave the rash professor a warning look which joe intercepted i then proceeded to explain what was meant by fool's gold and declared that the things in the professor's box were valueless bits of rock which we had picked up chiefly out of curiosity 
this statement however as i could see by our visitors faces was at once regarded as a cunning and cautious lie to conceal the vast value of our treasure whereabouts you got em queried joe again oh answered the professor there's lots of it floating around mud lake and beardsley brook he took a lively cluster of crystals out of his pocket and laughed to see how the indian's eyes stuck out with deluded avarice i felt angry at his nonsense for one of our visitors was an out-and-out -out ruffian in a few moments after a series of low grunts which baffled my ear completely though i was acquainted with the melicheet tongue the indians turned to go saying in explanation of their sudden departure sugar-lore for sundown maybe i took the precaution to display at this juncture a double-barrelled breech-loader into which i slipped a couple of buckshot cartridges and as i nodded them a bland farewell i said in melicheet it'll be late when we get to sugar-loaf the start they gave on hearing me speak their own language confirmed my suspicions and they paddled off in haste without more words no sooner were they well out of sight than i made ready with all speed for our own departure nor did i neglect to upbraid the professor for his rashness at first he pooh-poohed my apprehension declaring that it was fun to fool the greedy hottentots but when i explained my grounds for alarm he condescended to treat them with some respect he warmed up indeed and made haste so that we were once more darting along with the racing current before the indians had been gone above ten minutes but i could see that he had adopted my suspicions mainly for the sake of an added excitement the professor's classroom afforded too little scope for such an adventurous spirit and he was beginning to crave the relish of a spice of peril with his dainty rifle just to his hand he was soon plying a fervent and effective paddle while his sharp eyes kept a lookout which i knew very little would evade our design was to press so closely upon the rascal's heels that any plot they might agree upon should not find time to mature we knew they would never calculate upon our following them so promptly still less would they dream of the speed that we were making in a fair race we flattered ourselves that we could beat most indians and we rather counted on overtaking and passing this couple before they could accomplish aught against us there was one point in the stream however which i remembered with misgivings three or four miles ahead of us were the rapids which you remember we had such fun with a few days ago i suggested to h that there if anywhere those indians would lie in wait for us knowing that our hands would be well occupied in navigating the canoe those five miles soon slipped by as we shot down the roaring channel we saw in the reach beyond the last turmoil a canoe thrust in among the alders ah exclaimed the professor in a tone of deepening conviction and he shifted his grip upon his rifle an instant more and we were in the surges just then i saw the professor start half raising his rifle to the shoulder but the canoe was taking all my attention and i dared not follow his glance to shoreward our delicate craft seemed to wallow down the roaring trough the stream was much heavier than we found it the other day i can tell you at the foot of the first chute a great thin-crested ripple slapped over us i had understood the professor's gesture and as we plunged down the next leap i chuckled to myself sold this time like a bird the true little craft took the plunge one more blinding dash of spray a shivering pause and darting forward arrow-like she dipped to the last and steepest descent at this instant from the bank overhead came a spurt of blue smoke and a report followed by a twinge in my left shoulder another report scarcely audible amid the fall's thunder and cleaving the last great ripple we swept into gentler currents crack 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 went the professor's little rifle as he fired over his shoulder at the place where the smoke puffs clung i said push on before they can load again dropping my paddle as we passed their empty canoe i put two charges of buckshot through her birchen sides then satisfied that the mending of this breach would keep our enemy wholesomely occupied for some time we pushed forward swiftly in grim triumph a few miles farther on i stopped and informed the professor that i was wounded 
at this he turned about in such sudden concern that he barely missed upsetting the canoe but he presently remarked by the healthy vigor you've displayed in running away the last half hour i don't imagine the wound can be serious on examination we found that a bullet had nicked the top of my shoulder though not so deeply but that cold water and some strips of sticking plaster went far toward giving relief from pain but the muscular action of paddling caused the scratch to become inflamed and so when at about four in the afternoon we swept out on the smooth waters of the lake i gave up the stern paddle to the professor and played invalid a while in the bow a light breeze to which we hoisted our sail took us pleasantly down the lake and about half past six we landed near the outlet we tented just where camp de Squatook stood a few days ago under the lulling influence of a supper of fresh fried trout the savor of which mixed deliciously with the wholesome scent of the pines we concluded that perhaps by this time our enemies would have given up the pursuit disgusted by their past failure and the damage done to their canoe nevertheless we resolved to take thorough precautions lest our adversaries should cross the head of the lake and come upon us by night we built a huge fire so that it shone upon the landing place and lighted up every way of approach by water the tent stood out in the full glare to the rear and a little to one side beyond the limits of the grove in the densest part of the thicket we fixed ourselves a snug and secret couch whence we could command a view of the whole surroundings close by we arranged a pile of bark with kindling and dry balsamic pine chips such as we could urge into a sudden blaze in case of any emergency immediately behind us was the water and from that side we felt that we were safe so long as that glare of firelight should be maintained we fixed up the camp to look natural and secure hung our wet clothes to dry on the cheap lac wagon closed the tent door for the night to keep out the mosquitoes and retired not dissatisfied to our covert it was a dark and almost starless night with a soft rainy wind soughing in the pine tops and making the big squatook wash restlessly all down her pebbled beaches as we drew our weapons close to us and stretched ourselves luxuriously in our blankets we could not forbear a low laugh at a certain relish the situation held for us the professor however suddenly became serious and he declared but this lark's in the soberest kind of earnest anyway and we mustn't be letting ourselves tumble to sleep my shoulder gave an admonitory twinge and i cordially acquiesced just then a far-off howl of hideous laughter ending in a sob of distress came down the night wind making our flesh creep uncomfortably is that what the indians call glooskap's hunting dogs whispered the professor not by any means i answered under my breath well it ought to be returned the professor i replied that the voice in my opinion came from the dangerous northern panther or indian devil these animals i went on to explain for h s comfort were growing yearly more numerous in the squatook regions owing to the fact that the caribou their favorite prey were being driven hither from the south counties and from nova scotia just then the cry was repeated this time a little nearer and the professor began to inquire whether it was indian or indian devil about which we should have most call to concern ourselves his hope but half expressed was plainly for a whack at both i assured him that so long as the indian devil kept up his serenading we had little need to be troubled but should the scent of our fried trout be blown to his nostrils and divert his mind from thoughts of love to war then would it behoove us to be circumspect as we talked on thus in an undertone which was half drowned by the washing of the waves the panther's cry was heard much nearer than before and it was not again repeated this put us sharply on our guard hour after hour passed till we began to find it hard to keep awake only the weirdness of the place the strange noises which stole towards us from the depths of the forest dying out within a radius of a couple of hundred yards from the firelight together with our anxiety concerning the movements of the panther kept us from falling asleep 
the professor told some stories of the skill of western indians in creeping upon guarded posts and i retorted with examples of the cunning and ferocity of these northern indian devils once we were started into renewed vigilance by what seemed like a scratching or clawing on the bark of some tree near at hand but we heard no more of it when as near as we could guess it must have been well past midnight we began to be concerned at the lowness of our fire it had fallen to a mere red glow lighting up a circle of not more than twenty yards around the camp as for our covert it was now sunk in the outer darkness we considered the needs and risks of replenishing the fire and concluded that the risks were so far greater than the needs that our better plan was to stay where we were till morning if our enemies were upon our tracks then for either of us to approach the light would be to betray our stratagem besides furnishing a fair and convenient target while we felt tolerably sure that the panther was in some not distant tree waiting to drop according to his pleasant custom upon any one that should come within his reach these considerations made us once more satisfactorily wakeful and with straining our sight through the blackness our nerves got painfully on the stretch a bird stirred in the twigs above us and the professor whispered what's that then there was a trailing rustle of the dry leaves near our feet and with a sharp click and a jump of the pulse i brought my gun to full cock but two little points of green light close together which met my eyes for an instant told me that it was only a wood mouse which we heard scurrying away the professor whispered what was it disturbed the mouse he seemed in a hurry about something when he ran against us that way this was a point and we weighed it we were just about to hazard some guess allowing for an owl or polecat or other night prowler when the professor gripped my arm sharply and whispered look just on the outermost verge of the dim circle i could detect a human figure creeping like a snake toward the rear corner of the tent shall we shoot wound him whispered the professor breathlessly no wait i answered look out for the other fellow we'll capture them both and take away their guns the words were scarce out of my mouth when there was a sort of mad rush and a struggle apparently close beside us followed by an agonized shriek we sprang to our feet in horror and at once set our little beacon ablaze there not twenty yards off beneath a tree lay a twitching human form upon his breast crouched the indian devil with his jaws buried in his throat with a cry we sprang to the rescue and the beast half cowed by the sudden blaze seemed at first disposed to slink off but changing its purpose it set its claws deeper into its prey and faced us with an angry snarl the grove all around was now as bright as day the professor rushed straight upon the beast but for himself turning at the moment to draw my sheath knife i caught sight of the other indian whom we had forgotten in the act of deliberately drawing a bead upon me he stood erect close by the tent his pig-eyed countenance lighted up by the red glare i had just time to drop flat upon the ground ere a report rang out and a bullet went splat into a tree trunk close above me i returned the shot at once from where i lay and my assailant fell without pausing to notice more i turned to my companion's assistance he had just fired one charge into the animal and then drawn his knife afraid to fire a second time lest his shot should strike the indian as i reached his side the indian devil sprang but the ball had struck a vital spot and snarling madly it fell together in a heap while again and yet again went the professor's knife between its shoulders right up to the hilt as the dead brute stiffened out its sinewy length we dragged it one side and made haste to examine its victim the poor wretch proved to be tobin and we found him stark dead his throat most hideously mangled and his neck broken sickened at the sight we turned away the other indian we found still lying where he had fallen with his right arm badly shattered by my heavy charge of buckshot after brightening up the fire we proceeded to dress his wounds at this work we had small skill and dawn broke before we got it accomplished 
then digging with our paddles a grave in a sandy spot on the shore we buried the indian devil's victim and set out with our sullen prisoner for the settlements paddling almost night and day we reached detour du lac and there we delivered up our captive to the combined cares of the doctor and the village constable as we afterwards learned the doctor's care proved effectual but that of the constable was so much less so that the villain escaped before he could be brought to justice truly you keep your good wine for the last stranion said ranolph can sam do as well i wonder inquired queerman no he can't said sam positively but he can give you something humorsome at least to relieve this tragic strain it's about a bear of course i'm very glad my bears hold out so well this story is called bruin's boxing match end of chapter nine part one chapter nine of around the campfire by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the last campfire part two bruin's boxing match it was a dreamy sun-drenched september afternoon the wide shallow river was rippling with a mellow noise over its golden pebbles back from the river upon both banks the yellow grain fields and blue-green patches of turnips slanted gently to the foot of the wooded hills a little distance downstream stood two horses fetlock deep in the water drinking near the top of the bank where the gravel had thinned off into yellow sand and the sand was beginning to bristle with the scrubby bushes of the sand plum lay the trunk of an ancient oak tree in the effort to split this gnarled and seasoned timber jake simmons and i were expending the utmost of our energies our axes had proved unequal to the enterprise so we had been at last compelled to call in the aid of a heavy maul and hardwood wedges with the axes we had accomplished a slight split in one end of the prostrate giant an axe blade held this open while we inserted a hardwood wedge which we drove home with repeated blows of the maul till the crack was widened whereupon of course the axe dropped out the maul a huge long-handled mallet so heavy as to require both hands to wield it was made of the sawed-off end of a small oak log and was bound around with two hoops of wrought iron to keep it from splitting this implement was wielded by jake with a skill born of years in the backwoods suddenly as jake was delivering a tremendous blow on the head of the wedge the maul flew off its handle and pounded down the bank making the sand and gravel fly in a way that bore eloquent witness to jake's vigor the sinewy old woodsman toppled over and losing his balance sat down in a thicket of sand plums of course i laughed and so did jake but our temperate mirth quieted down and jake picked himself up out of the sand plums went to recapture the errant maul as he set it down on the timber and proceeded to refit the handle to it he was all at once quite overcome with merriment he laughed and laughed not loudly but with a convulsive inward spasms till i began to feel indignant at him when mirth is not contagious it is always exasperating presently he sat down on the log and gasped holding his sides don't be such an old fool jake said i rudely at which he began to laugh again with the intolerable relish of one who holds the monopoly of a joke i don't see anything so excruciatingly funny i grumbled in the head flying off an old maul and a long-legged old idiot sitting down hard in a sand plum patch that maul might just as well as not have hid me on the head and maybe you'd have called that the best joke of the season bless your sober soul answered jake it ain't that i'm laughing at i was not going to give him the satisfaction of asking him for his story so i proceeded to fix a new wedge and a hammer it with my axe jake was too full of his reminiscence to be chilled by my apparent lack of interest presently he drew out a short pipe filled it with tobacco and remarked when i picked up that there milehead i was reminded of something i saw once up in the madawaska woods that struck me as just about the funniest i ever heard tell of i most died laughing over it at the time and whenever i think of it even now it breaks me all up here he paused and eyed me 
but i don't believe you'd see anything funny in it because you didn't see it he continued in his slow and drawling tones so i reckon i won't bother telling you then he picked up the handle of the mall as if to resume work i still kept silence resolved not to ask for the story jake was full of anecdotes picked up in the lumbering camps and though he was a good workman he would gladly stop any time to smoke his pipe or to tell a story but he kept chuckling over his own thoughts until i couldn't do a stroke of work i saw i had to give in and i surrendered oh go along and let's have it said i dropping the axe and seating myself on the log in an attitude of most inviting attention this encouragement was what jake was waiting for did you ever see a bear box he inquired i had seen some performance of that sort but as jake took it for granted i hadn't and didn't wait for a reply i refrained from saying so well a bear can box some now i tell you but i've seen one clean knocked out by an old maul without a handle just like this one here and there wasn't any man at the end of it either here jake paused to indulge in a prolonged chuckle as the scene unrolled itself anew before his mind's eye it happened this way a couple of us were splitting slabs in the madawaska woods along in the fall when all of a sudden the head of them all flew off as this ere one did bill however bill gooden was the name of the fellow with me wasn't so lucky as you were in getting out of the way the mall struck a tree glanced and took bill on the side of a knee it keeled him over so he couldn't do any more work that day and i had to help him back to the camp before we left i took a bit of cod line out of my pocket ran it through the eye and strung them all up to a branch so it would be easier to find when i wanted it it was maybe a week before i went for that mall a little more than a week i should say and then it being of a sunday afternoon when there was no work to do and bill's leg being so much better that he could hobble alone he and i thought we'd stroll over to where we'd been splitting and bring them all in to camp when we got pretty near the place and could see through the trees the mall hanging there where we had left it bill all of a sudden grabbed me sharp by the arm and whispered keep still what is it said i under my breath looking all around use your eyes if you got any said he and i stared through the branches in the direction he was looking but there was a trunk in the way as soon as i moved my head a bit i saw what he was watching there was a fine young bear sitting back on his haunches and looking at them all as if he didn't know what to make of it probably that bear had once been hurt in a trap and so had grown suspicious that there maul hanging from the limb of a tree was something different from anything he'd ever seen before wondering what he was going to do we crept a little nearer without making any noise and crouched down behind a spruce bush the bear was maybe a couple of yards from the mall and watching it as if he thought it might get down any moment and come at him a little gust of wind came through the trees and set the mall swinging a bit he didn't like this and backed off a few feet the mall swung some more and he drew off still farther and as soon as it was quite still again he sidled around it at a prudent distance and investigated it from the other side of the tree the blame fool is scared of it whispered bill scornfully let's fling a rock at him no said i knowing bears pretty well let's wait and see what he's going to do well when the mall had been pretty still for a minute or two the bear appeared to make up his mind it didn't amount to much after all he came right close up to it as bold as you like and pawed it kind of inquiringly the mall swung away and being hung short it came back quick and took the bear a smart rap on the nose bill and i both snickered but the bear didn't hear us he was mad right off and with a snort he hit them all a pretty good cuff back it came like greased lightning and took him again square on the snout with a whack that must have made him just see stars bill and i could hardly hold ourselves but even if we had laughed right out i don't believe that bear would have noticed us he was so mad you know a bear's snout is mighty tender well he grunted and snorted and rooted around in the leaves a bit and then went back at the mall as if he was just going to knock it into the other side of tomorrow. 
he stood up to it and he did hit it so hard that it seemed to disappear for half a second it swung right over the limb and while he was looking for it it came down on the top of his head great scott how he roared and then scratching his head with one paw he went at it again with the other and hit it just the same way he'd hit it before i tell ye bill and i pretty near burst as we saw that maul fly over the limb again and come down on the top of his head just like the first time you'd have thought it would have cracked his skull but a bear's head is as hard as they make em this time the bear after rubbing his head and his snout and rooting some more in the leaves sat back and seemed to consider in a second or two he went up to the maul and tried to take hold of it with one paw of course it slipped right away and you'd have thought it was alive to see the sharp way it dodged back and caught him again on the nose it wasn't much of a whack this time but that nose was tender enough then and the bear got desperate he grabbed for the maul with both paws and that way of course he got it with one pull he snapped the cod line and the victory was his after tumbling the maul about for a while and trying to chew it and claw it to pieces and getting nothing to show for his labor he appeared absolutely disgusted he sat down and glared at the bit of iron-bound oak lying so innocent in the leaves and kept feeling at his snout in a puzzled sort of way then all of a sudden he gave it up as a bad job and ambled off into the woods in a hurry as if he had just remembered something this story had called forth a running commentary of appreciative chuckling when it ended every one was in a merry humour i think remarked queerman that i too have kept one of my best stories for the last at least it seems the best to me and i hope you fellows won't think it the worst anyway we'll tell you about that after we hear it said magnus well here goes continued queerman my title is the raft rivals the last log of terry Oates drive not counting a few sticks hopelessly hung up on far-off squatook shoals had been captured in the amber eddies of the lower basin below grand falls and had been safely pinned into the great raft which was about to start on its leisurely voyage down the river to the shrieking saws of fredericton this is as pretty a sight for pinning up a raft as ever i saw eyes on remarked ben smithers thrusting his hand into his grey-blue homespun breeches for his fig of blackjack ben was sitting on a rock near the water's edge no one made answer to his remark which was perhaps regarded as too obvious to call for comment presently a large black dog as if unwilling that any grain of wisdom should drop from his master's lips unheeded thrust his head into ben's lap and uttered a short bark for perhaps half an hour ben smithers and his fellows sat on the shore or lounged about the raft smoking and whittling and not one complained of the delay the rafts which terriolt had already dispatched down the river each requiring two or three hands to navigate it through the rapids had thinned the numbers of the drive down to not more than ten men all of whom were bound for fredericton on this very raft presently one of the hands took the pipe from his mouth tapped it gently on a log to remove the ashes and remarked here they be a wagon was descending the precipitous road which led from the unseen village to the beach an apprehensive-looking horse between the shafts hung back warily upon the breeching and a red-shirted lumberman clung doggedly to one of the wheels at the anxious horse's head trudged a boy and behind or beside the wagon as pleased her fancy there danced a five-year-old child her long yellow hair and bright pink frock making her look like some strange kind of butterfly as their eyes fell on the little creature a grin of rough tenderness flashed out on the faces of the gang little mame terriot who came with this wagon load of supplies for the gang and who was to accompany the raft down the river at once became the pet of the drive her father a young widower took her wherever it was possible and her baby hands were dispensers of gentleness throughout the roughest gangs only jake the dog refused his tribute of homage jake's heart was sore within him for he was jealous of little mame jake was a dog among ten thousand he possessed countless accomplishments and was ever athirst to learn more 
his intelligence was such that cute as jake had become a current phrase of compliment with ben smithers and his comrades wholly devoted to his master he was at the same time hail fellow well met with all hands until mame's appearance on the scene jake had reigned without a rival now it was quite different the hands though as respectful as ever seemed strangely forgetful of his presence at times and with ben when mame was by his place had become secondary and all his eager affection seemed to go as a matter of course ordinarily jake would have liked well to make a playmate of mame but as it was never the whole party had got aboard and the raft was shoved off into the current in the middle of the structure stood a rough temporary shanty of hemlock slabs with an elbow of rusted stovepipe projecting through the roof within this shelter the cook presided and two or three bunks gave accommodation for part of the gang the others including of course mame and her father looked to more luxurious sleeping quarters in the settlements along shore mame was enchanted with her surroundings with the shore slipping smoothly past with the ripples washing up between the logs with the dashes of spray over the windward edges of the raft with the steersman tugging on the great sweeps and last but by no means least with the wide sheets of glossy gingerbread which the cook in his little house was producing for her particular gratification she had never before experienced the delight of a raft voyage she skipped from side to side on her swift but unsteady little feet and all hands were kept anxiously alert to prevent her from falling into the water several times she made playful advances to the big dog throwing herself down on the logs beside him and scattering her yellow curls over his black and crinkly coat but jake after a reluctant wagging of his tail as if to indicate that his action was based on principle and not on any ill-will toward herself invariably got up and made a reserved withdrawal to some remoter corner of the raft Terriel noticed this as he had done on previous occasions and it seemed to vex him i don't see what jake's got agin the child that he won't let her play with him he remarked half crossly oh i guess it's cause he ain't no ways used to children and he's kinder feared o breakin her ben smithers responded laughingly jake had caught the irritation in his boss's tone and had vaguely comprehended it upon the boss his resentment was tending to concentrate itself he could harbor no real ill feeling toward the child but upon luke terriold he seemed to lay the whole blame for his dethronement toward noon the breeze died down and the heat grew fierce the yellow-pink gum began to soften and trickle on the sunny sides of the logs and great fragrant beads of balsam to ooze out from every axe wound the gang clustered as far as possible under the insufficient shade of the cookhouse in loosely sprawling attitudes hats off and shirt bosoms thrown wide open jake got down on the lowermost tier of logs and lay panting in a couple of inches of water surrounded by floating bits of bark and iridescent patches of balsam scum as for mame her pink frock by this time was pretty well bedraggled and frock and hands alike smeared and blackened with balsam her sturdy little copper-toed boots were water-soaked the heat had a suppressing effect even upon her and she spent much of the time in ben's lap in the shade of the cook-house but now and then she would rouse herself to renewed excursions and torment the raftsman's weather-beaten breasts with fresh alarms the river at this part of its course was full of shoals and cross-currents calling for a skilful pilot and Terriolt kept sweltering about the open raft rather than trust the steering to less responsible hands just as the cook with parboiled countenance came to the door of his den to announce the dinner mame had run to jake's retreat and crawled down upon the panting animal's back this contributed not at all to jake's coolness and he felt seriously disturbed by the intrusion slipping from under as gently as he could he moved away in vexation and mame rolled in the shallow water 
she picked herself up wet and whimpering and Terriault, who happened to be standing close by spoke angrily to the dog and gave him a sharp kick for jake this was a new and startling experience he could hardly resist the temptation to spring upon his insulter and pin him to the raft too wise for this however he merely stiffened himself to his full height with a sudden deep growl and rolled a significant side glance upon his assailant the boss was astonished at the same time he was just a little startled which made him still more angry and he shouted don't you snarl at me you brute or i'll kick you off the raft ben smithers interposed don't kick him again boss he exclaimed i don't mean no disrespect but jane ain't never had no kicks and cuffs and i'd rather he didn't have none less he deserves em he don't know what you kicked him for and he's only protestin he wouldn't hurt a hair of your head and as for mame howsomever he may keep out in her way of this here heat i just like to see anything try ter touch her on kind when jake war around you'd see then who was mame's friend during ben's expostulation terriolt had cooled down he laughed a little awkwardly and acknowledged that he hadn't no call under the circumstances to kick the dog but at the same time it was with no glance of affection that he eyed jake during dinner when the meal was over he cautioned mame so severely that the child began to look upon the dog as a bloodthirsty monster and thereafter jake was persecuted no more with her attentions the poor dog was none the happier on this account unheeded by his master who through most of the afternoon kept nursing the weary child in his lap the poor animal lay grieving on a far-off corner of the raft late in the afternoon the raft entered the succession of rapids lying below the mouth of Moncock. there are few shoals here but the steering is difficult by reason of turbulent water and cross currents about this time than which none could be more inopportune little mame woke to new life and resumed her perilous flittings about the raft the men who were not needed at the sweeps were kept busy in pursuit of her the swift motion the tremblings of the raft the tumult of the current these all enchanted and exhilarated the child like a golden crowned fairy she balanced tiptoe upon the upper logs clapping her stained little hands her hair blown all about her face suddenly forsaking ben's company she started toward her father where he stood at the stern of the raft directing the steersman the father reached out his hands to her laughing she was within three or four feet of him but she chose to tantalize him a little she darted to one side pausing on the very edge of the raft at this moment the timbers lurched under a heavy swell mame lost her balance and with a shrill cry of terror she fell into the pitching current a mingled groan and prayer went up all over the raft and terriault and one of the hands a big woodsman named van Deen, plunged in to the rescue ben smithers was not a swimmer and he could only stand and wring his hands terriault and the other who had sprung in were both strong swimmers but a narrow surface current had seized mame's small form and whirled it far away from the raft while the heavy bodies of the men grasped by the undercurrent were forced in a different direction terriault's face grew ghastly and drawn as he saw the distance between himself and his child slowly widening his desperate efforts could not carry him away from the raft and he marked that van Deen was no more successful than he a choking spasm tightened about his throat and he gave a keen sobbing cry of anguish as he saw the little pink frocked form go under for the first time then a great black body shot into the air above his head and landed with a splash far beyond him jake he thought instantly and a thankful sigh went up from his heart now he began to care once more about keeping his own head above water jake was late in noticing the catastrophe he had been deep in a sullen and heavy sleep when the cries awoke him he yawned and then mounted a log to take a survey of the situation in a second or two he caught sight of the pink frock tossing in the waves and of the little hands flung up in appeal his instantaneous and tremendous rush carried him far out from the raft and then his pure newfoundland blood made him master of the situation 
little he cared for the tumult and the white-capped waves his sinewy shoulders and broad-webbed feet drove him straight through cross-current and eddy to where the child had sunk when she came up he was within five feet of her and with a quick plunge he caught her by the shoulder and now jake's difficulties began in quieter waters he would have found no trouble but here he was unable to choose his hold the men saw him let go of the child's shoulder snatch a mouthful of the frock and start for the raft in this position mame's head passed under water and all hands were in a panic lest she should drown before jake could get her in but the dog dropped his burden yet again seized the little one by the upper part of the arm and in this position was able to hold her head clear but it was a trying position to maintain it jake had to swim high and to set his teeth with pitiless firmness into the child's tender arm the wave crest slapped ceaselessly in his face half choking him and strangling mame's cries every instant Terriolt and van deen were by this time so exhausted as to be quite powerless and were with difficulty pulled back upon the raft there stood all hands straining their gaze upon the gallant dog's progress ben smithers waited with a pike-pole on the very edge of the timbers ready to hook the steel into mame's frock and lift her aboard the moment jake got within reach slowly battling with the waves jake and his precious burden drew near the raft already ben smithers was reaching out his pike-pole suddenly there was a crash and the raft stopped short quivering while the waves poured over its upper edge the timbers of the farther inshore corner had run aground and wedged fast there was a moment of bewildering suspense while jake and his charge were swept swiftly past the hands stretched out to save them then the raft broke into two parts and the larger outside portion swung out across the main current and drove straight down upon the swimmer with a cry the raftsmen threw themselves flat on the logs grasped at the dog and succeeded in snatching the now silent child to a place of safety jake had just got his forepaws over the logs when the mass drove down upon his body his head went back under the water and ben who had a firm grip on the long hair of his pet's foreshoulder was himself well nigh dragged overboard two of his comrades throwing themselves on the logs beside him plunged down their arms into the boiling foam and got hold of the helpless dog and almost lifeless jake was laid upon the raft feebly wagging his tail the noble fellow lay with his head in ben smithers lap while the strength returned to his sinews and the breath found its way again to the depths of his laboring lungs as the gang gathered about and a babel rose of praise and sympathy jake seemed to appreciate the tribute when the boss had seen his child put safely and warmly to bed in the cook's bunk he rushed forward and threw himself down beside ben smithers he embraced jake's dripping body burying his face in the wet black ringlets and speaking words of gratitude as fast as he could utter them all this though passionately sincere and to ben highly satisfactory and appropriate was to jake a plain annoyance he knew nothing of the delights of reconcilement or of the beauty of an effective situation and he failed to respond he simply didn't like terry Oak. he endured the endearments for a little gazing straight into ben's face with a piteous appeal then he staggered to his feet dragged himself around to the other side of his master and thrust his big wet head under the shield of ben's ample arm terriot laughed good-naturedly and rose to his feet poor jake he murmured i ain't a-goin to persecute him with no more thanks seein he don't greatly enjoy it but i can tell you ben smithers what a mistake i make this morning and how it sticks in my crop now to think on it here the boss thrust out his hand and ben smithers grasped it cordially it was a general understanding that the boss thus apologized to jake for his behavior in the morning and that thus jake duly accepted the apology jake was expected to understand the proceeding as the gang did and to abide by it 
no atom of surprise was felt therefore when after the lapse of a day it became plain that jake and the boss were on the best of terms with mame on her proper place of idolized and caressed subordination that jake was not all unworthy to sit with jeff and dan said i as queerman ended no said ranolf he was a prince among dogs after this we told no more stories i who had all the records in charge made my report giving statistics as to fish caught miles travelled localities of camps and so forth as well as the names and tellers of all the stories the report proving satisfactory we sang home sweet home and old lang syne standing around the campfire then somewhat soberly we turned in right after breakfast on the following morning we put our canoes on the train and were soon whirling homeward proud in the consciousness of sunburned skins alarming appetites and renovated digestions end of chapter seven part two end of around the campfire by charles roberts